My my nephew Vance did pass away this early this week. So, so sorry. He was in a lot of pain and he suffered for a long time. So it's a blessing. Oh my, Peggy, where did he live? He lived in Temple, Troy, but it's outside of Temple, Texas. My goodness. So that that is, he lived near Lois and. Uh, right. Right. Okay. Hey, yeah. Well, that's too bad. Well, we want to we want to lift up uh, Ronnie Eckerson's family and the uh, death of his mother, Maddie Lou, Josh Wesley's family and the death of his mother, Emma Grace. Uh, Ray Edwards has uh, had to go back to the hospital at Baptist. Yeah, he he can't uh, even hold himself up right now. He is very weak. Uh, Steve Lawrence is still trying to shake off pneumonia left over from the uh, COVID. Uh, keep him in your prayers. Other I have one. Yes, sir. Bob, Bob Staten passed away. Rose and Bob Staten at Belleville. Okay. He passed away this morning. Bob Staten. Mm -hmm. All right. Vicky. Yes, indeed. Vicky, yeah. uh, I don't know if she's still at St. Mary's today or they got her transferred or not, but she, I don't believe they have, but I'm not positive. They're, they're taking her to uh, St. Vincent when she can be transferred or they have room and she's going to have a bypass surgery. So uh, she's in ICU right now. So keep her in your prayers. Well, my granddaughter, Isabel, is supposed to have surgery today, and I haven't heard. Okay. Gallstones. Oh, my. Oh, my goodness. That just makes you hurt to think about it. Anything else? All right. Well, we're going to go, we're going to go to God in prayer then. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we lift up the names of many that we love and care for that uh, are acquaintances and friends and family. Uh, some are grieving loss tonight because uh, their, their loved one has passed into your arms and, and we're thankful for whatever grace uh, came to them at that moment and, and thankful that they're no longer suffering. But we uh, know that their families are, that they're grieving, and we just ask your presence to support them and uphold them while they adjust their lives. For those that are uh, suffering sickness tonight, we, we ask your healing grace to be with them. Uh, for those that are facing serious surgery, uh, we, we certainly ask your uh, protection and care that they might be able to uh, not only know your protection, but know that your hand was in their surgery and uh, bring them healing quickly. We pray for our nation as uh, we seek to heal from uh, a rift and in a time of uh, terrible division. We, we pray for uh, the leaders of our nation. We pray for the protection and care of those who continue to produce vaccine and those who uh, stand on the front lines of fighting uh, this uh, terrible pandemic those that are uh, enduring uh, sickness and loss, Lord, just uh, let your presence be felt among them. Uh, help, help us as, uh, as a people to be people of hope, people of grace, and that uh, your love might shine through our living to those that need it the most. Now, as we study your word tonight, make us wise through the study of your scriptures, that uh, not only should we uh, learn facts, but that we might find uh, direction for, for living so that uh, we might uh, be more obedient to your word. So help us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Jim, could you please give me the times again for visitation and funeral and where it's at for Maddie? It is 10 to 1130 at Cornwell for the viewing. I don't think it's an actual visitation. It's a viewing. Okay. Did, I didn't yeah, the, the say, family, I didn't the say family that. will not be there. Yes. Uh, AJ got home all right. 
I didn't say that right, Peggy. I think it's yep. hold on. I'm gonna turn I'm gonna turn my screen around here. Let me <laughs> sorry, the library's gone. You had <laughs> we now have a magician in the family. I was just gonna say it's magic. I love it. It's on my chair. My green screen is on my chair. Uh, I've got it. I've got it on my text. It's eleven to one thirty at Cornwell's. Yes, eleven to one thirty, and then the graveside at graveside two. Graveside at New Hope at two. Stay. Stay. All right. Sorry for the confusion. Stay. Where is New Hope? Where is New Hope? <laughs> Go out Highway Twenty Eight. Pass out by the high school. Yeah. And and follow it. I can't tell you how many miles it is out there. It's, it's just before you get to where you intersect our road. It's a little before that. Is it on New Hope Road? Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's, I don't know that I'll go, but I'll stay. That's the very far south end of the road. Anyway, you take a right on New Hope Road and you'll come across to New Hope Baptist Church and the cemetery is right beside it. Off to your right. That's where uh, Lloyd Ellis is. Hmm? That's where Lloyd Ellis Grace's funeral was. Um, okay, y'all ready to dive back into Daniel a little bit? Yes, sir. All right, well, we shall. We're, we're, we got right up to chapter nine before we let off last week. And uh, chapter nine happens to be a prayer, and and it is inserted in the middle of these chapters uh, with some little time references. There's there's certainly several reasons for this prayer. It is uh, an explanation beyond anything about why the uh, people of Israel have gone into exile, as if they needed reminders, but. In the midst of this apocalyptic literature, as I have said, uh, they want to find hope. And they need to look back before they look ahead and say, okay, this is where we came from. This is where we don't want to be again. You know, well, where's our hope? Because we're still in the midst of trouble here. Why are we in trouble? Uh, so they're trying to find out through this message why they're in trouble and how long the trouble's going to go on. So, I mean, it's a look at the past. It's a look at the present. And then toward the future. And so it's been inserted here kind of as a reference so that people who are reading through this material will say, uh-huh, yep, I, I heard talk of when the exile was going and uh, now we're back in Jerusalem, but boy, things are not good right now. Uh, and and, and then of course, at the time that this material was written, it's not written at the time it's purported to have been written, but these people are going through a terrible time uh, as I've said, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes IV has come, he's died, but I mean, the people are still in just a terrible way in Jerusalem. Uh, and this has been, this has been uh, a long time after they were carried into exile in Babylon. Uh, so a little review of history is in order here to make some sense out of this. And then again, the whole purpose of being apocalyptic literature is so that they say, Okay, here we are. We can explain some of this. Now we need to understand how we can go on into the future. And of course, one of the, the answers to that is, is that God's already got it figured out. It may seem like that our side's losing right now and, and the enemy's got control of things, but we know that God wins in the end. And so that, that's the ultimate hope uh, for any people that are in trouble. All right, so let's go back to the first verse. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, now this would be the Persian king, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom. We remember that Belshazzar uh, lost the kingdom after the finger wrote on the wall that he was weighed and sifted and he'd come up short. And then the Persians take over. So, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures. Now, he's reading. Who, who's he reading? Well, we're going to find out who he's reading. All right. According to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. 
All right, so he has read some of the prophecy of Jeremiah. So I'm going to go back and uh, flip backwards over to, there's a couple references here, but I'll just read one of them. Uh, the most clear one is Jeremiah 29, verse 10. So if you want to flip backwards to Jeremiah, verse 10, it says, this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. All right. He's talking about Jerusalem. Jeremiah is writing from Jerusalem. The Lord's saying, I'm going to bring you back in 70 years. At least that's what Jeremiah understood. Now, historically, we know that that, that is not uh, the number of years that they were in Babylon. Now, that doesn't make Jeremiah wrong. What we have here, though, is, is going to help us explain some stuff in Daniel. Jeremiah most likely understood some of these numbers like a lot of the people of the Old Testament did. Numbers were holy numbers, magical numbers. We've talked about this before. Remember, everything that was significant in some of the Old Testament had to do with 40 days or, or 40 years. And, and I've told you before, that didn't translate from that original language to be a number like 40. It translated as a long time. Okay. How long did it rain on Noah's Ark? A long time. A lot of days and a lot of nights. How long were the Israelites in the wilderness? Well, a lot of years, a long time, 40 years. It, so we have to understand a lot of the Jews had some special numbers they thought were significant. God introduced them to them and th they understood that things happened in threes. They happened in sevens. Uh, and therefore, 70 was a good number, too, for things to be in, because the Lord had already told them in Scripture that the length of a person's life was going to be 70 years. You know, they might could live to 120, according to Genesis, but 70 was the number that had been given, too. And uh, so Jeremiah is probably trying to tell the people here in this prophecy, it's going to be a lifetime that these people are going to be away in, in Babylon, okay? So don't take that number literally. Just understand that whoever is writing for Daniel here took it literally. And, and that's a problem for this guy. Whoever's writing, it's a problem. So he's going to try to help reinterpret why it wasn't exactly 70 years. In fact, it was 48 years, you know, uh, historically, uh, the, the time that they were under the Babylonian uh, rule. All right. So let's go back and verse, we'll go back to verse three now. So I turned to the Lord and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting, in sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. O oh Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with all who love him and obey his commands, we have sinned and done wrong. Okay. Understand, we, we get this as written as one man petitioning the people for God, and this is Daniel. What we really understand here, though, is that this is a rehashing for us in the form of a prayer so that everybody who reads it goes, uh-huh, uh-huh, that's right. That is why we got in trouble. We, we have sinned and not obeyed the Lord. This is why we're in exile. Okay, we've sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and we have rebelled. All true. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. Verse 7, Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The men of Judah and the people of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far, in all the countries where you have scattered us because of your unfaithful, we of our unfaithfulness to you. Okay, so he's, he's just, again, he's reading the litany of the trouble here. Well, 
We were wicked. We didn't obey your commands. We didn't uh, listen to the prophets. Uh, we have been unfaithful. Verse 8, O Lord, we and our kings, our princes, and our fathers are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. It sounds a lot like what the Apostle Paul wrote when he says, all we like sheep have gone astray, doesn't it? It's, it's pretty close stuff. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the word spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing upon us great disaster. Under the whole heaven, nothing has ever been done like what's been done to Jerusalem. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. Now, he's turning a corner here, whether you realize it or not, because he's beginning, he's, he's moved from the past, and that sounds like he's repeating himself a little bit, but he is now talking about the present, the people who are reading it. Who, who is this written to? Well, this is written to people who are living in the mid-2nd century B.C., about 150 probably, 140, 150 B.C. They know that even though they have been free of the Persians for a long time, that they've got under the control of Alexander's empire, and now that Alexander's empire is falling apart and those uh, factions of his empire are fighting over Israel and they just see one army come through to, to be changed out by another one. And not only that, there is a group of uh, Zionists, you might say, the early Zionists. Uh, these, these are the sons of John Hyrcanus and these are the ones that are written about in the books of the Maccabees. And they're, they're like uh, terrorists today you might think they're 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 against anybody who is not letting them do their worship anybody that is uh trampling on their land and they are just creating havoc and uh we're going to find out as we read along here that whoever is writing this is not in favor of armed rebellion they're in favor of petitioning god for the answer and, and so when he's talking about the people who are sinning now he's not just talking about the whole people of israel He's specifically talking about the people who have taken up armed rebellion against the, the other forces that are occupying their land. But again, there's a larger question going on here. Well, if, if Jeremiah said 70 years, and, and as far as he was concerned, it was 70 years, well, how come it's, it's kept on going on for hundreds of years now? Why are we still in, in the stink and not getting out of this mess? Well, we were sinners then, we're sinners now, we're continuing to fight against other people. Uh, this writer is, is telling them the cause is, is going to fall on their own heads. All right, verse 13. Just as is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not sought the favor of our Lord, our God, by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. The Lord did not hesitate to bring disaster upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. In other words, we're not blaming God. We're not blaming the prophets. We're, we're blaming ourselves. We're, we're, we're the ones causing the trouble that's fallen on us. Now, O oh Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand, who made for yourself a name that endures to this day. We have sinned. We have done wrong. And he's talking about the present day. What's continuing to happen. Oh, Lord, verse 16. In keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and the iniquities of our fathers have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. <clears throat> this is the woe is me stuff now. Verse 17. Now, 
Our God, hear are the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, O oh Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. All right. Now, I remind you that in 167 B.C., Antiochus Epiphanes, the Seleucid ruler, came through, set up a statue to Zeus, slaughtered pigs on the altar in Jerusalem. The desolation, you know, this is, this is the abomination that causes desolation. And this is exactly what he's praying about right here. The people have seen it. The people know about it. He's confessing it in his prayer and in so many words here. So, oh, Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, oh, God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Oh, Lord, listen. Oh, Lord, forgive. Oh, Lord, hear and act. For your sake, oh, my God, do not delay because your city and your people here bear your name. Okay. So. That is the prayer, and, and again, the whole purpose of that prayer being written in this little space in here is, is to focus people's attention on why we are still in trouble, okay? We are still in Brother, trouble. Brother Jim, that yeah. last sentence kind of caught my attention because uh, it says, O oh Lord, oh Lord, give an act of delay not for thy own sake. In other words, and I I've read this in other parts of the Bible, but because God is holy, I mean, it's like they're putting it back on God. That because He is God, He should be able to. He should do something. Well, Not because of the people necessarily, but to with hope to uphold His name. Yes, He's holy and the. I mean, God. it's a good. It's a good point, and the and the purpose of Him saying this is. God, aren't you embarrassed for your own namesake? Right, right. Yeah. In other words, even if we can't be righteous, do something, anything, because you're being embarrassed by us. In other words, I mean, this is another way to say it. <laughs> okay. So let's let's talk about this. Obviously, he 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 has taken wholesale this idea that there were 70 years, which is, is wrong, but he's now going to tell us a little prophecy here. And again, it's easy to prophesy when you're looking backwards and, and can count the days. So verse 20, while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, and making my request to the Lord, my God for his holy hill, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift light about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to you to give insight and understanding. As soon as you began to pray, an answer was given, which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the message and understand the vision. All right, this is, this is like, how do I say this? <laughs> Explaining away his prediction. <laughs> well, first of all, until now, God hasn't used intermediaries to tell Daniel things. Daniel prayed and got the answer like that. You remember the other stories, that, you know, trying to prove Daniel's worth? Well, I mean, God answered directly. I mean, we get immediate answers. He, he goes and prays and has a vision. Well, now there's intermediaries. Who, and, and Michael and Gabriel are some of these intermediaries. And, and now somehow or another, uh, not only is there warfare on, uh, you know, in the land, but now there is spiritual warfare so that God's messages can't get through because he's been giving them to these archangels. And they're having to fight their way through for days to get to Daniel to tell him the message. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that that's really good fiction, but not much, not much holding a lot of light in that. Uh, uh, this this has been used to write all kind of Christian novels in our day and time, but 
factually not not really we don't we don't have anything to rest that on you know it we don't get those stories about uh the angel coming to tell mary uh you know that she's going to bear the son of god or any you know i man i had to fight for a month to get here to tell you this message mary but boy are you the woman the lord is looking after well again we have to take this for what it is this is literature that's been incorporated into scripture and pulled together and again it's not from one writer it's from several writers uh, they wrote in different languages they wrote at different times but they're trying to comment in daniel's name on recent events so that they can make a perspective so that we understand how god's at work in behind these events so hang hang on okay just hang on all right so as soon as you begin to pray, an answer was given, which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the message and understand the vision. Verse 24. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. All right, now, I have a footnote that they mean the most holy place right there, not the most holy like the Messiah here, because if it was the Messiah, that's definitely out of context and not right. And, and so the authors or the, the people who are commenting here are trying to help us understand they mean the sanctuary to be cleansed, made holy. Well, how do you do that? You get rid of the pig's blood. You get rid of the altar for Zeus. And, and reconsecrate the temple in Jerusalem. All right, so 77s, well, there's seven days in a week, and 77s, of course, is 490. And 490 is about a year and a half, and that's about the amount of time from the time that Antiochus Epiphanes set up the abomination that causes desolation in the temple to the time that he, off in a foreign country, dies of some disease. And that's the end of that. And his rule comes to an end and the Israelites get to reconsecrate the temple. So we, we understand that as this is written, people can look and say, aha, Daniel got the message. Dan, you know, it was delivered from God by uh, Gabriel, one of, one of his archangels. And, and we know exactly what has happened. So it's, it's putting kind of a religious spin on the event so that this writer in gives us some secret information because everybody wants secret wisdom, right? You want to be on the inside track. You want to know all the events uh, and the things that were going on behind them. And, and so this is kind of like a news report from the front. We get the blow by blow here to know exactly how it happened. All right. So first 25. I'll just start over there. No one understand this from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. The anointed one, the ruler comes and there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to the sacrifice and the offering. And on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end is decreed and is poured out on him. Okay, so again, here is a rehashing of, of Antiochus Epiphany IV coming, doing all this terrible stuff. But in the end, we know God's going to cut him off, and, and so is the message from Gabriel. I know that's a lot of stuff right there, folks. Uh, I'm sorry, Daniel is a messy book. And, and as I said before, it's not one book, it's a collection of writings. But uh, we, we, the more we know the context, 
the better we're able to kind of suss out what was going on and why each part was written the way that it was written for the people. All right. Now we're really going to jump off the cliff because when we get to verse or uh, chapter 10, chapter 10 and 11 really are all, all one story. And, uh, and if you ever want a recount of, of actual history, of the way things actually, I mean, you can line all of the stuff up that's in chapter 11 and put names on it. I mean, this wasn't even secret stuff. This was less than apocalyptic. This was just somebody going back through and telling exactly how it was and just kind of protecting the names and the faces a little bit so that we, you can read this stuff and go, aha, <laughs> these people, this was fresh on their minds. They knew exactly who each of these characters was. It was not any kind of mystery like it may be to us today, but these people knew exactly everything happening in chapter 11 was recent history. And they say, look here, Daniel wrote this stuff 300 years ago and here it is. It's come to pass in this last 10, 15 years and here it is. By golly, we get to see the prophecy all fulfilled right here in front of our eyes. All right, so let's dive into chapter 10. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belshazzar. Its message was true, and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. What, what they're telling us here is he didn't even go and bathe. Uh, that, those uh, folks in Persia and the Middle East, they, they don't bathe like uh, we think of with water. They take and uh, put lotion on and rub the old sluffy skin and stuff off. And so Daniel's saying he didn't, he didn't do the dry wash with the lotion. Verse four, on the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of the finest gold around his waist. His body was like chrysolite, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze and his voice like the sound of a multitude. That's pretty scary stuff, isn't it? I, Daniel, Verse seven, was the only one who saw the vision. The men with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was left alone gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking. And as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. Verse 10, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you and stand up for I have now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. Verse 12, then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. All right, so we have to make some comments here. This is not a human being. This is some heavenly being. We're not going to give a name to it here. But it, it will next because it'll go ahead and tell us it's Michael again. Uh, but at this at this point in time, we just need to understand that there's a concept that's going to be put in front of us in this next paragraph or two, where there have been given charge of different lands, heavenly beings who are in charge of of taking care of God's business in that land. So there's like, you know, an archangel for Persia and there's one for 
uh, you know, another area. Well, they're also opposed by uh, forces uh, from Satan uh, who are fighting against God's uh, representatives to make sure that none, nothing good happens. And so the purpose of, of writing this in this manner again is so that people understand that, well, you know, perhaps maybe the reason that, uh, you know, we haven't, we haven't had any peace here lately and things are not the way that we thought they were going to be is maybe not that our prayers weren't heard, but that there's a spiritual battle, battle going on that we can't see at all. Daniel's going to reveal it here. And that's the reason that things are still in such a turmoil. Well, there's still hope because God's going to win in the end, but they're saying, oh man, things are so out of control right now that even the, in the heavenly realms, there's war going on. And so that that's why things are so tough here. So it's another kind of an explanation excuse for, for why things are so bad because uh, they're at a loss. The religious people are at a loss to explain things. All right. So, uh, okay, I'll read verse 12 over. Then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God. Your words were heard and I have come in response to them. But the prince of Persian, the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future, for the vision concerns a time yet to come. Okay. So this, we're, we're about to wind up to this. Here it comes, folks, but wait for a few more paragraphs. While he was saying this to me, I bowed with my face toward the ground and was speechless. Then one who looked like a man touched my lips and I opened my mouth and I began to speak. I said to the one standing before me, I am overcome with anguish because of the vision, my Lord, and I am helpless. How can I, your servant, talk with you, my Lord? My strength is gone and I can hardly breathe. <clears throat> Again, the one who looked like a man touched me and gave me strength. Do not be afraid, O man, highly esteemed, he said, peace. Be strong now, be strong. When he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, speak, my Lord, since you have given me strength. So he said, do you know why I have come to you? Soon I'll return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go, the prince of Greece will come. But first I'll tell you what's written in the book of truth. No one supports me against them except Michael, your prince. And in the first year of Darius the Mede, I took my stand to support and protect him. Now, this is all that angelic being talking here is, is what we're to understand. Okay, so the good guys are outnumbered by the bad guys. This is like a Western. You know, when uh, the good guys have been taken by surprise, they had a, a message everybody needed. And here comes all the bad guys and heads them off at the pass and they're delayed. There's a big shootout until the good guys get the upper hand and deliver the message. And so we, we kind of get the background thing going on here. All right. Verse two, where are we? 641. We got, a, we got time to wait in a little ways here. Now then, I tell you the truth. Notice he's already said it's the book of truth and he's telling the truth. I mean, we, we better believe this is the truth, right? Well, it's going to be the truth because it's already actual history and they've written it down. They just changed the names a little bit. So it's really, everybody's going to go, yep, that's the truth. Now then, I tell you the truth. Three more kings will appear in Persia and then a fourth who will be far richer than all the others. Okay, so they can count. They can count the kings in Persia. And they're going, all right, Cyrus, Xerxes, Artaxerxes, Darius the Third. I mean, they're, they're naming them. You know, these people have already come. All right, when he has gained power by his wealth, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. All right, 
Well, what's happened in history since they have been released by the Persians and all these Persian kings live? Well, we know what happened. Uh, we had uh, the, the Macedonians rise up against the smaller powers in Greece. And Philip of Macedon, uh, he takes most control of, of the, the nation of Greece, the state of Greece. And then he is, uh, well, he's pushed out of the way. I'll put it that way. He's pushed out of the way by his son, who is Alexander. And we know Alexander as Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great doesn't take long to conquer the whole world. He does it in 10 years. He and his armies march all the way around the Mediterranean and off toward India. And then uh, when he has conquered all that he can about conquer, he goes back to Babylon, he catches a disease and he dies. Then everything blows up after that. So verse three, a mighty king, and we're talking about Alexander now, will appear who will rule with great power and do so as he pleases. And after he has appeared, his empire will be broken up and parceled out toward the four winds of heaven. Well, that's a good description because we know that his four commanding generals took control of things when he died in Babylon. It will not go to his descendants, nor will it have the power to be exercised because his power, his empire will be uprooted and given to others. Okay, also known history. The king of the south, now, when you hear the king of the south, we know they're talking about Egypt. And, and yeah, this, this is the Ptolemies. This is the Ptolemies. The king of the south will become strong, but one of his commanders will become even stronger than he and will rule his kingdom with great power. Well, Seleucus I was the first one that became the Syrian ruler and started fighting with the Ptolemies. And... These are the two powers that they're caught between when all of this history has happened. Now, verse six, after some years, they will become allies. The daughter of the king of the south will go to the king of the north and make an alliance. Well, that's also historical. We know who that was. That was uh, Bernice and it was Ptolemy II. Uh, let's see, but she will not retain her power and he and his power will not last. In those days, she will be handed over together with her royal escort and her father and the one who supported her. Well, he, uh, he was actually poisoned by his first wife, uh, Laodice. Uh, so done in by the poison. One from her family line will arise to take her place. This, this would be uh, Ptolemy the third uh, I can't even pronounce the last name. I'll just skip it. <laughs> he will attack the forces of the king of the north and enter his fortress. He will fight against them and be victorious. He will also seize their gods, their metal images, their valuable articles of silver and gold, and carry them off to Egypt. For some years, he will leave the king of the north alone. Then the king of the north will invade the realm of the king of the south. Now, this is uh, Antiochus III but he will retreat to his own country. His sons will prepare for war and assemble a great army, which will sweep on like an irresistible flood and carry the battle as far as his fortress. All right, we need to stop and make a footnote here. I, even though this is kind of a rehashing of ancient history, we know why this was written. Everybody's shaking their head, uh-huh, this was, man, we're getting the inside track. We know exactly what Daniel was writing back uh, all these centuries ago, which is, not when it was written, of course, but it makes it sound like it's, it definitely was cut right from the book of truth. Uh, when, when, we're, when we're going through this and we're reading this, you know, we have to put ourselves in the place of those that this was written to and say, okay, this has given us hope because we know that Daniel is such a great prophet. He saw everything. There wasn't anything that God didn't disclose to him because we can just check yeah. every little thing here and go, yep, yep. Damn. Every one of those, that's a fulfilled prophecy. All right. What time we got? 6.47. All right. So uh, verse 13, for the king of the north will muster another army larger than the first 
And after several years, he will advance with a huge army fully equipped. In those times, many will rise against the king of the south. All right. Now, uh, if we if we went back to Ezekiel, we'll have to make a cut here in a minute and stop this. But we'll go back to Ezekiel next week and we'll see the beginning of this rebellion that eventually ends up being into the hands of uh, John Hyrcanus and some of his sons and th their descendants who become these terrorists who, who he was praying about in, in chapter nine. Oh, uh, what we need just we need to stop though and, and look at, at some of this history where he's not done talking about all the things in the battles. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take a stop right there, but just remember every time that the king of the south and the king of the north had it out, where did they have it out? Well, they had it out in Israel. I mean, they were those armies were marching this way and then they were marching that way. And I mean, every few years, here you go again. I mean, it's it's hard times uh, and they they still aren't clear of it at the time that this is written and so again all all of this is kind of self-explanatory literature to say hang on god's still in control even though it seems like everything's such a mess uh and, and daniel has made the hero of all this by saying look i saw all this long before it ever happened just know god's in control and that's why we say this is apocalyptic literature and, you know, it, it gives people hope to get beyond the worst of things. And, of course, what Daniel doesn't tell us about, because he hasn't, he hasn't lived or seen any of this, of course, yet, is that even after this, the Romans are coming, and they're going to even be worse than the rest of these people. Uh, so, again. Well, Brother Jim, are you yeah. saying then that Daniel wrote this after, after the facts, but he's just saying that he saw it all before? Yes. Okay. Now, just wanted I did, to make that clear. Well, again, we know we know that several writers writing under the name of Daniel, all of these right. were collected into a book that got put into the Hebrew uh, canon of Scripture, and you know they're writing for different reasons. When we get to chapter twelve, we'll we'll get to some of the most obvious reasons they wrote because some of the other stuff that they predicted or prophesied didn't even happen. And so what, what happens in chapter 12 is they say, well, what we really meant was this, or God meant that. And, and so it really it gets real hokey at that point. Uh, but again, the, the stuff that is written in Daniel, there is some prophetic stuff that's different, but a lot of it, the vast majority of it is apocalyptic. Uh, the the stuff that was prophetic was back in those earlier chapters when it wasn't trying to be predicted, uh, and, it, and it was some messianic stuff that, that was written in there that's absolutely true. Uh, but the the more the more they write in Daniel trying to be real predictors of of the events and saying this is a prophecy for sure, the less you can actually believe it almost and. And they just kind of were just really getting out there on a limb. And, and at the, after chapter 12, they just kind of fell off and quit writing in Daniel's name because none of it could be proven after that. And, and so why is it here? Well, it's here for the same reason that lots of, of books are in our Bible. It was contemporary scripture written for people in trouble. It was probably ordained by God to give people hope. We're not going to deny that, but we just need to understand and handle it carefully so that so that when we, we put it all back down, we can say, even with these writers writing some of this stuff that just was almost to the nonsense stage here, God could, God could use it. And God used it to get people through a, a terrible... And it, it is also... It's also a reason why today people are hesitant to put new material in the Bible. I mean, I mean, if you look at Revelation and it says, you know, anybody that's going to add anything to this, may all the curses of this book fall upon them. You know, you remember some of that? Well, what book is he talking about? Well, he's just talking about this, this book, this Revelation. 
that John received. I'm not talking about the drugs will have got the paper. But because people interpreted it that way, they never seen any stuff in the Bible after Revelation came along. Now, there's certainly plenty of great Christian from writers. Yale County. Scriptural. So we just need to. No, you take with you. Okay. Well, here, that's, you take it's it's Willie. <laughs> She's got a visitor, I thought. Yeah, I muted her there. Okay. <laughs> What, what I'm saying is people have been afraid to add literature. It's not to say that God has quit speaking, that there haven't been prophets, or not still prophets of God, but that we've got a lot of information. It's, it's plenty for our edification that's in this Bible. And, and the better we understand it, the better off we're going to be. But what we definitely don't want to do is, is start adding stuff like Daniel back in, which kind of goes off on a, a, a fictional bent at times to to try to give people hope as i said before we don't want to take jerry b jenkins writing and and put all of the left behind series in the bible and say well that's scriptural well it's not scriptural <laughs> some of it's based on scripture just like some of this is based on scripture but you know hey we could probably take some whole writing that billy graham did and stick it in the bible and say that ought to be canon of scripture you know, there's plenty of people who've written like that, that speak for God. But who are we to say? I mean, the last time they said this was inspired by the Holy Spirit was back in 381 AD when, when they canonized the, the books that are in our Bible. And they're not even the books that are in our Bible anymore because, as I said before, they took all the apocryphal ones and ripped them out. They decided some of Daniel was so crazy and kooky, they, they hauled it out too. Uh that's just to say we need to understand with wisdom and understanding and the scholarship that goes behind it, what we've got in our hands and then let it still speak to us today. I'm not against people teaching Daniel in the lion's den or the Meshach and Shadrach and Abednego uh, in the fiery furnace or any of that stuff. What I'm saying is though, don't, don't just start taking whole batches of material like some of this that we know is not prophetic and say oh that's prophetic for sure because daniel said that's prophecy uh we got we've got to be we've got to be realistic and careful and and match our facts up all right now and just and just as we get inspiration from the bible there's many writers that write books etc that give you a lot of insight into god and, and Absolutely, and we ought to so read you got, material. Yeah, so there's a lot of material out there that you can learn too. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I mean, if you want to go down to the Christian bookstore and buy something that Chuck Swindoll wrote or another, you know, contemporary writer who's written lots of great teaching material, by all means. Uh, but but in everything, you know, put a little grain of salt on it and just make sure that it matches up with scripture. And as long as they're teaching within the pages of scripture, we're good to go. And, and it can be edifying. It can uh, be inspiring. And, and that's what we want. That's why it's written, we hope. But we still got to be careful. Yes, ma'am. We still got to be careful. And, and that's why there, you know, there was a sensation a few years ago uh, when somebody found a long lost book uh, that they, you know, well, why is not that not in the Bible? Because it tells the boyhood stories of Jesus in it. Uh, well, there's a reason because it was as furious as some of the, the the Daniel stuff that we'll read. When we get to the end of chapter 12, we'll stop and we'll read Bell and the Dragon and Susanna, and you'll see why they got taken out of the Bible. Some of them were inspiring stories, all right. They were they were like the first six chapters, trying to kind of create the hero prophet. Daniel by, by, you know, telling some stories here, but uh, they're so fantastic stories that nobody believed them. That's why they got ripped out of the Bible. Uh, unless you believe that there's dragons and, uh, you know, mythical creatures. So there you go. <laughs> All right. Somebody pray us out of here. We, we, we have been in a fine mess tonight, folks. I'm, I'm doing my best to to part the waters. Yeah. 
Here I go again. Okay, Bobby. <laughs> You're our man. Blessed, blessed Father, as we read your holy word and we study people like Daniel who interfaced with you in those times, let the story reach our hearts and let us understand what you are telling us and what we need to take from it. We face times like this now and we need to know where to go through this mess that we're in. Now, dear God, please be with each one of us. We have concerns we choose not to share. We need your wisdom and guidance to work through them. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Let, let me share another word while we're still, we still have most everybody here. Uh, if anybody would like to take part in a Wednesday morning Bible study, Ken Lawrence is going to be doing one starting next week at the Life Center, social distance, but it, it will be more of a devotional nature. He'll take a scripture each week and do a short devotion on it. Uh, there'll be time for prayer. It'll be kind of a slash fellowship group. Uh, so if, if we've got anybody here that would like to be a part of another group or is not part of a current fellowship group or who would just like to come and, and uh, be together with others in the church. This is an opportunity for fellowship. And I want to make that, that invitation to everyone. Uh, it'll be Which Wednesday be morning. Leader? Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock. Ken Lawrence. Ken Lawrence. Ken Lawrence. He is, he is a great uh, Bible studier. And uh, I, highly, I highly recommend him. And uh, if someone like Georgiana wants to attend, she can just bring uh, monkey business and her Catholic Bible, and it'll all be good. <laughs> she won't. <laughs> <laughs> no monkey business. Ken is also a great prayer. Yes, he is. So I, I commend that. And if any of y'all would like to take part in that, I'm trying to keep a head count. Let me know. Call me. And, and let me know you want to be in that study and I'll, I'll add your name to some other names that we're calling to try to get the group going. All right. No. We're okay. done. Good to see y'all. Y'all stay. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. <laughs>